Three families are about to go back in time. I feel almost like I've been sentenced to five months hard labor. You could have the best intentions of coming out and, and starting a life here, and before you know it, you're bust. It's not quite as charming as it once was, and the Garden of Eden has turned into hell. Fictionalized, mythologized, often romanticized. Now, see the real experience of life on the frontier. Funding for Frontier House is provided by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation to enhance public understanding of the role of technology. The foundation also seeks to portray the lives of the men and women engaged in scientific and technological pursuit. Corporate support is made possible by... Bob's Red Mill Natural Foods, makers of over 400 stone ground whole grain products for every meal of the day. Our all-natural products are available at your local grocer or natural foods market. Bob's Red Mill Natural Foods, to your good health. And by Georgia Pacific. Life on the frontier would have been different with GP brands like Quilted Northern Bath Tissue, Brawny Towels, and Dixie Cups and Plates. Georgia Pacific. We make the things that make you feel at home. Major funding is provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. For five months, Three families have done their best to live like the original pioneers. Now winter is approaching, and the end is near. For the homesteader that came out here, talking about risk, that family risked everything to come out here. They risked dying coming out here. We personally, this family, risked dying coming out here. Risk. I'll tell you, these people, that's, that was their middle name. And some of them made it, and some of them didn't. I'd like to think I could make it through the winter. I'd like to think that, you know, our cabin is well built enough that we would have, would have made. But, you know, it's hard telling, not knowing. 30% of the people actually made it. That means one of these families. I mean, we've all done the math. One family's going to make it, two are going to fail. Only the fittest survived the five years required by the Homestead Act. So before they return to the modern world, the families have to prove they can face the ultimate test. In Montana, particularly in elevation we are, we can have serious, serious winters. Okay, on three. One, two, three. They're digging in. <sighs> They have to show they can endure six months of blizzards and minus 30 degree temperatures that make up a Montana winter. Winter is an opponent. It's uh, something that we're preparing for to do, to do battle with. You know, we'll see how we stand up. We'll have to use all of our wit and skill and capabilities. A little bit of gym trickery, see if we can outsmart old man winter. In 10 days' time, the Frontier House experts who trained them in May will return and assess the preparations on each homestead. We only have 10 days left, but we're still hitting it at max speed. Knowing that you're gonna be judged and knowing that people are gonna be evaluating you, even when you think you're doing a great job, there's always a little bit of anxiety attached with that. And I have a bit of that anxiety, you know, with the experts coming in and, you know, what their final judgment's gonna be. Hopefully they're going to look around here and, and just be overwhelmed with what we've done, just blown away, and that would be great. And even if they're not, we are. Mark Glenn was the first to have the idea to build a root cellar. Soon thereafter, Nate Brooks and Gordon Clune built theirs. When Mark started to build his root cellar, you know, the guys were complaining Word got back that they felt obligated then to do likewise because you know, all Nate and Gordon heard about was Mark's root cellar. So I think that kind of made it 
almost like competition. The root cellar that we dug, you know, the door's gonna open in. I mean, can you imagine having a root cellar where the door opens out and it's winter and you got eight feet of snow? Ain't gonna happen. You need food, guess what? You're shoveling for three hours. Competition. Gordon's a competitor. Karen's competitive, and I'm competitive. Uh, Nate's competitive. You don't have companions anymore, you have competitors. You don't have friends anymore, you have opportunities. That's just, it's, we've brought that, we've brought that filth and that negative aspect of the 21st century right back into 1883. I'm competing with this land. I'm competing with this dang weather. I'm competing with the fact that winter's coming on. I don't wanna compete with anybody else. Insulated by earth and snow, root cellars retain a constant underground temperature of about 50 degrees, ideal for storing vegetables. Oh my god, that's huge! Look at this one. These are some of the biggest carrots we pulled out of our garden, and this is our most deformed one I pulled out. Hey, there was something here yesterday. Some Sorry, gardens have been more <laughs> fruitful than others. Oh, look! Look at the size of these. These yeah. are fantastic. We got a good garden going on, and it's no, no baloney, okay? There's no falsity out there, and there's no accusations there. I mean, the proof is in the garden. You could say all kinds of things, but the bottom line is that ain't a bad garden, and I'm proud of it. And uh, not too bad for a city slicker. <laughs> to celebrate their accomplishments, the families come together to plan an 1883 harvest fair, complete with contests and prizes. About the. Um the skillet throwing and the axe throwing. We were for skillet throwing. Mm -hmm. Gordon didn't carry the way on axe throwing, right? He didn't mind either way, so. Yeah. This is an exciting time. The, the fair is a time to get with the people of the community and have fun and compete. And, you know, we've all been bragging if only to ourselves about how good our bread is. And so now it's, it's kind of fun to see if, if it ranks up there and gets a blue ribbon or a red ribbon or just an honorable mention. Yeah. My biggest fear is that my bread doesn't win first place. I'll just die. <laughs> We'd win that hands down. We've got two, two goals. <laughs> yeah, I, don't know I hope we can move away from feeling like it's a competition. I hope we can celebrate the fair so everybody could kind of let their guard down and let the, the burden, the intensity of, you know, being graded, being evaluated, um, and let that go and then, you know, kind of kick up our heels and, and have a good time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That skittle throw. Yeah. You know, that. Getting ready for the fair, getting ready for winter. It's been a lot of work, but I don't think that has been as challenging for us as just trying to get along with our neighbors. Like in the little house on the prairie, we've had our Mrs. Olson, and we've had a neighbor who's made Mrs. Olson look good. She has the idea that this is a, a competition, and she wants to win. I know she's even deprived her family of food so that they have plenty of food for assessment. And it's sad, it's sad to see them living like that. I'm not overly excited about doing anything physical. I mean, I've been doing a lot of things physical. So you're not gonna be boxing with Nate? <laughs> no, I don't think so. We don't need the damn fair to have a boxing competition. <laughs> <laughs> Over a hundred neighbors, historians, and advisors will attend the fair. To feed them all, the Glens have agreed to slaughter their pig. But they've all become attached to Jojo Pumpkin. We've been talking a lot about what kind of food to have at the fair. We've pretty much decided on having pig. Okay. Our pig. We don't need anything to eat at the fair. Well, yeah, we do, honey. It's going to be all day. We love our animals, and we are not going to kill our pig just for a fair on the, for one day, it's a waste of a life. That's farm life, honey. Farm life is not just raising animals. Farm life is raising those animals to be harvested. We are nice Southern, we let things live, and now we're killing something that is so stupid. You butchered a pig before, Logan. I didn't name that pig, Mom. God. Well, maybe you shouldn't name it then, honey. Maybe it should just be the pig. I know that you're disappointed. And I know that we're not going to kill her. Logan, we are. The decision's already been made. 
and the butcher will come tomorrow to kill the pig. Livestock that isn't slaughtered in the fall will have to be fed through the winter. So the families have been harvesting hay. Anyway, it's only for big ones because it's too... Everyone will be assessed on their hay supply, and the clunes are low. Although it's September and the grass is brown, Gordon believes he has found a new source. We're getting together a lot of hay. And the reason we're getting together a lot of hay, we have, we have a very good field that was not accessible to Mr. Davenport's cattle. So we've known that, and we, ha we haven't been in that mad rush to harvest by August 1st. Never were. The original Montana pioneers were caught unprepared by the severe winter of 1886. Without enough hay, some said their sheep ate the wool off each other's backs. 60% of the cattle in the territory starved to death. The Brooks finished haying a month ago and are stockpiling another essential winter supply, firewood. For all the families, firewood is crucial to survival, both for cooking and as a source of heat. Chopping wood is like the manliest thing you can do. So it's just like all about the man out here. There's almost something like, you know, I, I saw the mountain and I climbed it, or I, you know, that wood and I split it. There's just something masculine about overcoming challenges. This place is like a men's playground. It's like a men's dream come true. Man, you just hit the wood. No, the whole technique is not actually the hitting. When I become one with the wood, I go it basically bread. splits itself, for it provides me heat, which sustains life. The tree is now dead. I will give it a second life. We're like support staff. You know, we just kind of keep the engines running behind the scenes. And that's not fun. That's not the glamorous thing. The women's work is just so repetitive. I think it's just kind of drudgery. There are times I get resentful about having to clean up always, especially the cleaning up of the dishes. It just never ends. This is my existence right here, you know? Every time you come talk to me, I'm right here because this is where I spend my days. Men are so much less complicated than women. Women want, they want more than just shelter and food. They want something to look forward to. They want to be entertained. They want a break from the monotony. In five months, I've only had probably about three or four meals that somebody else prepared. All the rest I've done. It's almost like I was transported to a labor camp for five months. I have experienced depression here on the frontier. I've never been depressed before in my life. I've never had to deal with that before. And here, I've probably been depressed easily three times a month for a day or two, and where I felt like all I wanted to do was go back to bed and cry. I regret my wife hasn't had quite the gratification that all of us have. Her plight in this uh, homestead experience has been more dismal and more mundane. And the accomplishments that she wanted, like sewing an outfit or making a quilt, didn't happen. And it couldn't happen, I think, in the plight of a woman. But the rest of my children, including myself, we're all leaving here feeling like better human beings, better equipped to enjoy the things that we take for granted in our 21st century lives. If you think about it, it's taken us a few months, but it's, um, it's become a labor of love. A lot of this labor has become enjoyable. I like paint. I've always liked paint. Gordon's daughter, Anya, and his niece, Tracy, have avoided traditional women's chores as well as traditional standards of dress. Yeah. I like Hain a lot. It's probably like my favorite kind of job out here. It's really fun. But I only do it when I'm in the mood for it. There's like days that I want to and there's days that I don't. 
Young women growing up on the frontier were often the first to break social barriers, both in the home and out. In fact, they pushed for and won the right to vote at state level nearly 50 years before their counterparts in the East. With the fair and the assessment just a few days away, the families are putting their final touches on their homesteads. I gotta make bread, take a bath, do laundry, and then we gotta wash those windows. I'm not doing that. Thank you. After a busy summer, the Glen homestead now runs like clockwork. The cows are trained to turn up at 6 a.m. for milking. Okay, baby. I'm ready. If anything, I think Mark and I can show that you can be a successful unit and not just be head over heels agreeing and loving and blah, blah, blah. I'm sure in 1883 that a lot of marriages weren't based on all this emotional love that we talk about in the 21st century. Because out here, you, you know, I hate to say you really don't have time for it, but it's really not very practical. Water. You know, if I'm in there cooking and, and Mark's wanting to get all romantic, he's gonna get hit in the head with a hot pan. It's just how it is, or I'm gonna get slapped with an ax, you know? The fair will be a time for everyone to have fun and strut their stuff. But the assessment is more serious. Their wood is cut, hay is stacked, the lawn is manicured. With their homesteads ready, the families realize that in a few days they will be heading back to the 21st century. I'm angry because I've got to leave. I'm leaving a place that I love. I'm angry at the fact of how much I uh, invested myself in this place and how attached and close I am to it and how I'm. Uh, It's gonna be. This is gonna be tough. This it's gonna be tough leaving here. Even departing, I think. Uh, just. Just let it speak for itself. Just... Walking out of here, I think I've got to have the biggest smile on my face that you've ever seen. It'll be like, freedom. <laughs> freedom. It's time for Logan and Jojo Pumpkin to say goodbye. The local butcher has arrived to supervise the slaughter. Hey, girl. <laughs> Why are we doing this? Logan, you know, every time that we go to McDonald's, you know, the only reason McDonald's is around is because there's a lot of cows out there being killed. And that's not necessarily saying that's a bad thing, but you've got to understand that. OK? Logan, it's a cycle. You raise animals all spring and summer to kill them in the fall. And that's how it is. She's been a good pig, and she'll serve us up well on Saturday, and she'll serve her purpose. And that's exactly what her purpose is, to feed people. Cut and dried. The emotional stuff is just all baggage and nonsense. This is what we're here for. About right here, Mike. Perfect. And I'm going down to Nate and Kristen's because they'll know what to tell me. Okay. And Gordon and Adrian probably won't. There's your safety right there. I'll okay. go ahead and push that in. She should be ready to go. Okay. Yeah, there's one in there. Mark, you're shooting her? Yep. I don't want anybody else shooting our pig. I don't think that's right. Jojo, come here. Mm 
he's burying my shoulder. That's it. Don't turn him. Oh, honey. Come here. Not feeling anything, sweetie. She's gone. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's just the nervous system. I still feel strongly that you know, if you're going to live the farm life, then you need to live all of it. And it's not all happy and fun in a petting zoo. You know, some of it is that you do slaughter some of your animals, and that's something that I needed the kids to understand before we left here. Perfect, right there. Okay. The modern world forced its way into Frontier Valley on September 11, 2001. The families were informed of the tragic events. To honor those who lost their lives, Adrienne Klune is sewing an American flag. I'm making this flag in the wake of the recent tragedy. I'm an immigrant to the United States myself and my life is here. The United States is my adopted country. There's a spirit and a vitality and an energy that I've always loved and admired, and I love being part of that. And I think maybe a lot of it even comes from the homesteading experience. We've experienced that same spirit and that enthusiasm and that go and get it kind of attitude. The day of the fair has arrived. Their flag has 38 stars, one for each state in 1883. Just tell us when, Ned. Okay. Woo if you'll gather around, we'll raise the flag. As homesteading communities grew, so did America. Within seven years, Montana and five other Western territories would add their stars to the flag. Here we do it. Thank you, guys. Perfect. Welcome to Frontier Valley. The Clones, the Brooks, and the Glens want to thank you guys for coming. Everyone here today, directly or indirectly, has made a contribution to these three settlements. The Harvest Fair is a tradition that immigrants brought with them from Europe. Gatherings such as these were beginning to define the region's culture. Well, oh, you know, I'm not normally a gambler here, right. but I'm feeling lucky. What you're doing is you're trying to find the red one, okay. and there's two black ones. So I'm going to mix them up, okay. and then you, f you pick the, uh, the red one. Shoot, I'm, I think it's over here. Well, it isn't over there, okay. In the same year, 1883, in Omaha, Nebraska, Buffalo Bill Cody held his first Wild West show. Buy gummy, I'm gonna say that one. Yep. Oh, bingo, Ooh. bingo. And down south in Pecos, Texas, they held one of the first rodeos ever. Ready, go! <laughs> Mm. 
Jojo Pig. I think Jojo would be proud that she's made such a contribution and we're all enjoying her so much. Even Karen got a piece of her. I'd talk her into it, but she did. She did. Time for the crosscut saw competition. These couples have been doing this for five months. They've had a lot of practice at it, and they're very, very serious about this. Ready? Pretty good. Whoa. My God, you guys are hot. <laughs> I haven't seen anything right like that in years. <laughs> Congratulations. Time for the axe throw competition. Double blade axe open only to the homesteaders. Michael's going to go there. Keep, keep the rhythm going. Oh, that's a good rock. Take that, seven. Yeah. Among the crowd are the five frontier house experts. Tomorrow, they will assess the family's homesteads. Ladies and gentlemen, time for the awards. Baking, decorative cake, Adrian Clune. Congratulations. Prettiest chicken, the Glenn family. Good job, Logan. Wheelbarrow race. Gordon and Tracy Clune. Farewell to Lane County, farewell to the West. I'll travel back east to the girl I love best. I'll stop in Missouri and get me a wife. Live on corn dodges the rest of my life. It's Judgment Day. The Frontier House experts are on their way to assess winter preparations. For the families, this is a moment they've been waiting for. This is the, uh, the egg collection. Oh, oh. Your eggs. oh, and brown eggs. You got the great, uh, great chickens. They're the, they're the oh. freshest of the fresh. Here, what? guys, we have homemade woven wire made out of a roll of straight wire where he went from nail to nail and done his own little woven wire. Isn't that cool? Excellent. Nice yes. Throughout the day, animal expert Rawhide Johnson and construction expert Bernie Weisgerber examine buildings and supplies, like wood and hay. I'll take that to be 22 feet. Okay. The kerosene lamp, I would just pull it. Historian really Sue Kane, and just sit and we could just Linda Peavy, and, okay. and Ursula Smith study domestic preparations and food supplies. Six people sleep up here. In the evening, they convene at the schoolhouse. They've accomplished an incredible feat for such a short period of time, and they've kept pretty well focused on the basics of food and shelter. Especially for shelter. That yes, for shelter. shelter. Oh, yeah. All yeah. across on for shelter. shelter. All three families fashioned working farms. They found ways to make money and build structures like chicken coops and root cellars. Just watch your step. Come on in. I was really impressed with 
what Gordon had done with the chicken house, the outhouse, the root cellar. I was, I was impressed by all of that. Certain efforts stood out. Adrian put forth the effort to pickle more things than the other two women had. So I was really glad to see that. Aaron's done the best job of taking care of the animals of any of the people on site. But the acid test was whether anyone would survive the winter. Due to the fact that the clunes harvested their hay a little late in the year, it's no better than straw hay, which has very little feed value to it. We hate a lot of stuff in August, and we hate a lot of stuff in actually fairly recently. Though Mark Glenn has cut four cords of firewood, the experts estimate he would need at least three times that to get through winter. All three families have problems in the firewood area, in my opinion. I remember something we talked about in Virginia City, and I was really specific about this with them. I said, you're going to be cutting firewood every chance you get, and you're not going to have enough, you're not going to have enough. They, they didn't listen, they didn't hear that. They didn't hear no. it. That would have been the most scary thing that I saw. The families could be as much as 90% short of wood. The kids and I have been, you know, had been gathering wood. So there, here's some, uh, we, we call them wafers. We don't really even know what you call them when they're cut up like that. We call them wafers. And Gordon, other not enough wood, enough nowhere near enough wood. I saw just one that. really small pile of rounds that were cut, and, or wafers. Wafers. Yeah. Yeah. Wafers, I was going to them, but, that um, must be an Irish term. Right, right, so. yeah. um, <laughs> the historians were impressed with the rope bed that Gordon Clune built for his children. Well, this is the old sleep tight, don't let the bed bug us bite. Uh, that was sleep the, tight <laughs> is what that meant. Really? Yes, the ropes uh -huh. had to be tight. But they were less impressed by what they uncovered under Gordon and Adrienne's bed. And a box frame, too, right? Yeah. What do you call those? Ones? The clunes have smuggled a modern box spring into their cabin. Unless we broke it sitting on it. This little luxury would not be available in the West for more than 50 years. You see things like this from the 30s and all. We actually found it at an abandoned cabin. Under cover of night, the clunes say they salvaged the mattress from a dump site and have been sleeping on their secret for a month and a half. Secrets are golden out here. When there's varying degrees of rules that may or may not have existed in 1883, it's very confusing and very muddled, and I didn't quite honestly pay a lot of attention to any of them. For Gordon, cheating the historical accuracy of the frontier house can be justified. If opportunity shows up at your door, do you turn it away? And a homesteader, would he turn it away? Not a chance. Someone that's gone through tremendous deprivation, not a chance. Someone that's ambitious and wants to succeed and make a better life for himself and for his family, not a chance. If opportunity comes a knocking, you take advantage of it, and that's the American spirit. <laughs> Without getting too emotional. <laughs> We were having problems with laying the eggs and we're Aware their homestead is in trouble, the clunes make up a scheme in which half their family would retreat to the safety of a nearby town over winter. I really think that this plan to send Adrian, the girls, and Connor to Butte is because they're at a loss to do anything else. They see that winter's coming. They know they're going to be assessed. There's a lot of artful dodging going on here. If you don't have enough hay, you sell the horse. But you know, you can bend rules and so forth, but one thing about life in Montana and in other hard to live places, winter, you don't bend nature's rules. It's it will judgment. kill you. It's judgment it brings... Day. The experts need time to write up their reports, so the families will have to wait for a final verdict. On the last day, the snow begins to fall. Snow is hit. Winter's here. We're leaving this morning. And I gotta do all these dishes. I am so sick of boiling water 
and washing greasy dishes with a greasy rag. I'm sick of it. I'm done. So that, my friends, is why they find abandoned cabins with breakfast dishes on the table. For me, it feels, uh, you know, wonderful. It feels like uh, the culmination of, of a long uh, fairy tale. And the snow helps. I would encourage fathers and sons, mothers and daughters everywhere to set down the distractions and concentrate on what really matters. And, and what really mattered when we were out here was um, finding some neutral ground, finding a place that my father and I were able to work together and worked hand in hand and were able to accomplish uh, so much. When I close my eyes, I see all of these buildings and outbuildings, the chicken coop, cabin and outhouse dotted with, with the fingerprint of my father. I see my dad on the other side of the crosscut saw and you know that's that's where it gets good and that's that's where the joy is. And if we can tap into that on a more regular basis, um, that's in the end I think the deeper meaning to the Frontier Project. Dear Lord, thank you for allowing us to gather around this table once more and our final meal here on the frontier. We've prayed so many times to have your guidance and to stay with the righteousness and keep true to the project. Lord, thank you for the animals that was, were provided for us. Thank you for the things that brought the family closer together, even though we still have our problems we still keep on going and then we get friends again watch over all of us on our travels home amen 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 i'm glad we decided on the quiche because it's eggs from our chicken and bacon from our pig we'll eat up guys this is the last meal on the frontier life is just about eating things and getting things and killing them but every animal that's raised is going to be killed that's just how life is, basically, if you think about it. I'm so sad that I'm leaving. I think, I don't know if I'm going to get to take Snowball home or not, but if I don't get to, I'm probably going to cry <laughs> because because he's been such a good friend to me. And I love him so much. And I really don't want to say bye. I get the good book. You know, I didn't get much time to read this, but you understand, God, I've been, uh, you know, about your business out here, raising a family, and we thought about you a great deal out here, and. Certainly thank you for taking good care of me and the whole family and keeping us healthy and uh, looking forward to uh, continuing on these lines when we get back to the future. Thanks a lot, Lord. <laughs> we wanted to leave here so bad from the very beginning. We just wanted to get out. But then like the day comes that we're actually going to leave and it's really sad to think about it. Because to think about it, we built all this. And now we're just going to like leave it here like there's nothing to it. It's pretty sad. This like project has given me a whole nother chance. I think I've learned a lot out here. I think I'm more responsible. I think I've grown up a lot. And I think I have confidence in who I am and what I am. I don't know, when I get back, I'm not gonna let people boss me around and tell me what to do all the time. I'm gonna have an opinion of my own and not care what people think. Ready?
Whenever you're ready. Two months have passed, and the frontier is now a memory. Nate and Kristen are in Cabo San Lucas, Mexico, on their honeymoon. Since we left the frontier, we've basically been uh, gypsies. We we're without a home or a car or jobs, um, just kind of traveling around. We've uh, taken our honeymoon here to Mexico. In modern life, there's almost too much to choose from. So I'm not really sure what to do. You know, we could do anything. We could get a master's in anything and recreate ourselves and become anything and make any amount of money and <clears throat> have any amount of kids. And it's overwhelming, you know, I'm not sure exactly which one to pick. Nate and Kristen are finally given the verdict on their winter preparations. I think Nate and Kristen are perhaps in the best position of the families. I would agree with that. Would you? Mm -hmm. And I, I want to weigh in, I agree. I think they're in the best shape. I think so too, but I do think that it's because there are the two of them and they're young and that you can get away with an awful lot. Hard telling, not knowing. We're not there to go through winter. In Malibu, California, the Clunes have moved into the new house that was under construction when they went to the frontier. These days, Gordon seldom gets a chance to enjoy it as he travels so much for work. I'm back and I'm, guess what I'm doing? I'm traveling, I'm here, I'm there, and my uh, paycheck is automatic deposit in my bank. <laughs> and uh, has anything changed? Well. Um. I, I, I landed up mowing my lawn for the second time for God knows how many years yesterday with my kids. There was a sense of satisfaction all of us got from that, and that was fun. Will you try it then? You're a man or a woman working hard in 21st century, and your kids don't know what it is that you do. It's seamless. They're isolated from it, and that's sad. And uh, I realize that more so than ever since I've been back. But in five months, in 1883, I got more satisfaction, more accomplishment, more appreciation than I did in my entire career beforehand. We're living in something 10 times the size of the cabin, at least. And the cabin never felt small to me. It always felt adequate. You know, six of us living in that, I never felt like we were cramped or that it was too small. And then to move into this, this was really tough for me to adjust to. I'm still adjusting to it. It just felt way too big and way more than we needed. And I was actually lonely. You know, the first couple of nights we slept here, I was lonely for the children because we were all so spread out in this big house. Everybody had their own room. I felt like I was moving further away from the children and it was, it was kind of a strange feeling, you know. And you can be in the house and somebody else can be in there and you really don't even know where they are. I like the new house a lot, but I don't know, it's kind of weird, like when you're in it all by yourself, it's too much room, too much space. I kind of like being in a small, smaller place. It's kind of lonely. <laughs> I don't know, like some rooms don't even get used. 
Like, no one even has ever in them. <laughs> this is definitely the century to live in, I think. It's, it, our lives are much easier. To me, this, this symbolizes definitely freedom. It's just incredible. I mean, really, it's like a miracle. It's unbelievable. I think the year 2001 is kind of boring. Mm -hmm. Every day I always say I'm bored and my parents get mad at me for it. There's nothing to do. <laughs> I don't know, there's just nothing to do here. Like, you get kind of tired of going to the mall every day and you get kind of tired of yeah. doing nothing all day. Basically, it's really boring and you have to make it fun yourself, I guess. Now it is Adrienne and Gordon's turn to read their winter assessment. We all agreed that they worked really hard, yep. but mm -hmm. they may have worked hard in the wrong direction. To be sadly realistic, we will have to say that if we are judging this experiment by the clunes, the 21st century family could not have made it on an 1883 homestead. It's, it's, um, you know, it's, a, it's opinions. We would have made it. There's no question. And we'd have hunted. And you know, that root cellar we made would have been full of game. I know that. You, I'm gonna show you something. You wanna see something? This is an 1883, this is 2001. This is what this family can do 2001 in Malibu. And that's put, putting game in their freezer. First thing my boys did when they came here is a hunt. And this is Malibu rapid. <laughs> so, you know, that's all I'm going to tell you is let's get real. If you want to get real about talking about 1883 and if, a, if the Kloon family can survive, we can survive. In Pleasant View, Tennessee, Mark and Karen learn that while their homestead was ready for winter, there were other concerns. They are physically prepared for winter, but when the world closes in and puts them in that little room, there are tensions among the best relationships. If they can hold it together, working for the same goal, then I think they might make it. You know, it's, 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 it's kind of harsh in some ways, um, Suze, but it's very realistic in that I think it's, um, everyone, knows that the first winter would have been the toughest winter. Yeah. That's the big learning curve. Yeah, I agree. In 1883, uh, they wouldn't have known whether they could make it through the winter or not unless they actually went ahead and did right. it, which I wish we could have. When we returned from Montana, it was quite difficult um, between Mark and I. You know, I felt like it, at some points, Mark and I were two mules pulling on the same rope, but in absolute opposite directions. And one of us was gonna get dragged or killed or something. You know, it was just, I don't know. It just wasn't healthy. It was about two months since we've been back. Um, the decision was made that it might be better for the relationship if we spent some time apart. And so currently Mark is living in an apartment in Nashville and I stayed at the house. I, more so than anyone else, needed to get gone and think through what happened out there. When we got home, I, I got the feeling that I, I just wasn't comfortable at home. I wasn't comfortable anywhere, but I wasn't comfortable at home. Um, there wasn't, I couldn't think. I, I couldn't get things straight in my head. Maybe it's cheating. Maybe I'm running away from problems that I'm not willing to face with my wife or something. Welcome to the Glen uh, Annex number two. This is just kind of where I work at and where I sleep at right now. Don't know where I'm going, what I'm going to do, but this is it. It's just kind of a place to uh, hide from the world after Montana. This is it. Welcome. $12,000 cars will go for $8,000. I miss the clones. I miss Nate and Kristen. I miss Rudy when he left out there, and I still miss him. 
I mean, I wish that Rudy lived next door to me and uh, Gordon and them were upstairs and, and they and them were down the hall. I do, and I wish my family was with me. And I, and I wish that we were still out on the homestead. After about five years, we could have all gotten together with our homesteads. And I think that we could have made one hell of a good community. We, we just scratched the surface. Are we singing all four? Are we singing all four? One thing that was real revealing for me is the significance of my church family. It, it was my church family that loved me before I went to Montana, and they prayed for me to return safely from Montana. And, and my church family loves me now. No matter how I'm depicted, they don't care. They're still gonna love me. And that's what I need, I think, right now. I need to feel that kind of um, encircling kind of relationships. I don't watch TV that much, but I do listen to the radio a lot. But Logan's obsessed with the PlayStation now. I don't know what. Uh, he was fine without it on the Frontier, but then all of a sudden, when he gets it, he's like glued to it. In the 21st century, you're bored because there's so many things. It's like you have so much stuff that you're just bored of all of it. In 1883, you had such little stuff, it was like special to you and your mom would buy you stuff and things just for you. It's an unnatural life that the 21st century offers us. I think there's just too much. There's too much stimulus. The pace and the noise and the, uh, you know, the fluorescent lighting, and it's a bit overwhelming. Geez, you know, your principles, your ideals, your morals, they're all for sale. I think there's a lot of problems that we're just not admitting. You know, maybe we should all have this encounter group that my name is Mark, I'm a member of the 21st century, and have a 12-step program for it or something. Take a virtual visit to Frontier Valley at PBS Online to explore the experience as it happened. There's also homestead history and more video diaries at pbs.org. You can just make them. Make them. Make them sing out and just all of a sudden. Just makes you move. Makes you groove. Go, Daddy. Mice are definitely especially fearless this evening. My even more fearless husband has killed three with his bare hands this evening in the past 20 minutes. Three blind mice. See how they, <laughs> see how they three die. Three dead mice. Funding for Frontier House is provided by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation to enhance public understanding of the role of technology. The foundation also seeks to portray the lives of the men and women engaged in scientific and technological pursuit. Corporate support is made possible by Bob's Red Mill Natural Foods, makers of over 400 stone ground whole grain products for every meal of the day. Our all natural products are available at your local grocer or natural foods market. Bob's Red Mill Natural Foods, to your good health. And by Georgia Pacific. Life on the frontier would have been different with GP brands like Quilted Northern Bath Tissue, Brawny Towels, and Dixie Cups and Plates. Georgia Pacific. We make the things that make you feel at home. Major funding is provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting 
and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.